we'll call upon the other speakers, Dr. Ravi Kiran and Dr. Vela Idam to the dais, please. Dr. Ravi Kiran will be giving his uh, first talk on insulin regimens in pregnancy, what works, and followed by that, we'll have uh, Dr. Vela Idam's uh, speech, followed by Dr. MSA Shadris. We welcome the chairpersons, Dr. Vani Pujari, Dr. Nyana Shankar, and Dr. Shanmuga Vadu to the dais. Good evening, everyone. I am honored to be in this uh, August gathering. Prem and uh, the whole team of uh, Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry Society of Endocrinology, it's a huge, huge success. And um, a little bit partiality, welcome to all our uh, OGSYS people. We have been really enjoying the sessions. We had a very good uh, session. It was um, all the three topics were eye-openers for us and especially so many varieties of uh, PCOS before we uh, dump uh, Lady's PCOS. Um, so now we have an equally interesting session. The first topic is by Dr. Ravikiran Muthuswamy. He's a consultant endocrinologist at uh, Sims Hospital, Vadapalani. Special interest in diabetes, obesity, thyroid disorders and childhood hormonal disorders. Published clinical research articles in international and reputed national journals. Authored chapters in diabetes and endocrine textbooks published by ESI and reputed national bodies. So he is going to deliver a lecture on uh, insulin, what works in pregnancy. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. So today we'll be seeing briefly about the principles of uh, diabetic management in pregnancy and also about uh, insulin usage. Hyperglycemia, we all know that uh, it could be either uh, pre-gestational diabetes, uh, women with diabetes uh, entering into pregnancy, it could be a type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes or other types, or it could be a glucose intolerance diagnosed in pregnancy, what is classically described as gestational diabetes. A brief view of carbohydrate metabolism in pregnancy. In pregnancy, there is relative fasting hypoglycemia. However, uh, it alternates with postprandial spikes, especially after breakfast. The metabolism is directed toward supplying glucose and amino acids to growing fetus and providing extra free fatty acids, ketones and glycerol as sources of maternal fuel. This is a chart depicting a relative insulin requirement during the three trimesters of pregnancy. We can see there is a dip in the late first trimester followed by a plateau, then gradual uprising of the curve from 24-28 weeks onwards. So this is where the genesis of gestational diabetes, classically described gestational diabetes lies. There is some uh, minor insulin deficit which causes gestational diabetes. Uh, there is almost a two to three times requirement, higher requirement of insulin during the later weeks of pregnancy. So we all know well the relation between glycemic status and complications. Pre-gestational is classically associated with uh, congenital defects, including in heart, skeletal and CNS. However, the other complications which are encountered with gestational can occur with uh, pre-gestational also, including macrosomia, birth trauma, hypoglycemia, respiratory distress syndrome, hypocalcemia, hyperbilirubinemia, thrombocytopenia and polycythemia. Uh, this classical study tried to plot the risk of fetal anomaly relative to periconceptional HPA1C. The result was quite revealing. In general, HPA1C less than 7 or 7.5 is taken as uh, reasonable uh, when entering into pregnancy. But where possible, where we see the patient before uh, pregnancy, we should strive to bring down the HPA1C to 6 to 6.5 without uh, inflicting extra risk of hypoglycemia. Here we can see towards the higher HPA1C is actually the curve is quite uh, widespread. So it becomes even though we know that uh, the relative risk of uh, encountering uh, fetal malformation is high with HPA1C more than 10 or 12, it becomes difficult to predict exactly which patient may be having because of the widespread curve. So glycemic control preconception is very essential. If uh, this is one end of the spectrum, another end is the gestational diabetes which develops late in pregnancy. Uh, there are a lot of uh, trials and meta-analysis which have conclusively shown that uh, some of the aspects of uh, GDM are uh, well benefited with uh, intensive treatment, large for gestational age, macrosomia and uh, shoulder dystocia. So coming to the management per se. These are the components of uh, management of uh, diabetes in pregnancy, uh, SMBG and strict monitoring, medical nutrition therapy, 
mild to moderate exercise and medications. Glycemic targets and monitoring, this is a very uh, elegant study by Hernandez et al. What they did was they took uh, women in gestation at around the late th third trimester and studied the patterns of glycemia. What they found was that uh, there was a relative fasting hypoglycemia and a sharper postprandial excursion after a meal. Especially the excursion was uh, very pronounced around the breakfast. And from their study, they found that uh, normal mean uh, glycemia, some cutoff if it has to be taken, it could be one hour cutoff of 122 and two hour cutoff of 110. And mean peak glucose level was found at 70 minutes in this study. There are other outcome based uh, uh, studies from which also glycemic target could be arrived at. One such is the HAPO study. Uh, where they found that four parameters, birth weight more than 90th percentile, primary cesarean section, clinical neonatal hypoglycemia, and uh, high cord blood serum C-peptide, were analyzed against fasting glucose, one hour glucose, and two hour glucose. For most of the parameters, uh, all three uh, timings were equally important, thereby suggesting that uh, in a given patient, we can choose to do fasting, and either one hour or two hour uh, postprandial glycemic check. So these are the glucose targets given by one of the international bodies. In a typical GDM, preprandial glucose of less than 95, one hour PPG less than 140, and two hour PPG less than 120. If the patient is already having diabetes for a significant period, a little wider range should be uh, provided. Uh, Pre-meal glucose could go down up to 60. Peak postprandial glucose, we should strive to keep it uh, less than 130. And A1C should be brought down to less than 6% as soon as possible. So one of the crucial elements in uh, achieving this is uh, through adopting a basal bolan regime and uh, a very stringent SMBG, more than three times daily at least, which may include morning fasting, one hour or two hour postprandial uh, check, and before bed. After the sugar is very well controlled, probably we can scale it down to fasting plus three times post meal. It could be either alternate days or twice a week, once in three days. There are uh, studies with continuous glucose monitoring. It fills the gap where we are expecting glycemic excursion to have happened, which might have got undetected with SMBG, especially in early morning, uh, late evening, like that. So a few words about medical nutrition therapy. Uh, these are the basic uh, uh, nutritional uh, nutrition that should be provided, 70 gram of protein, 28 gram of fiber and 175 gram of carbohydrate. So the total amount itself is not restricted but rather uh, we should give more if possible. But rather the, it is split in such a way that the glycemic excursion does not occur. So we have to avoid two sugary items, highly processed foods, sweet kanji, fruit juices. The most important thing is to emphasize uh, to the patient that she has to eat frequent small meals both to reduce the risk of postprandial hyperglycemia as well as to avoid preprandial starvation ketosis. This is one of the charts given by international body how we can go about uh, adjusting the diet. The, one of the important things to note is in South Indian diet we tend to the patient the lady tends to eat uh, four or five idlis uh, in her uh, pre-pregnancy preconception uh, uh, usual course of life that has to be specifically explained to her and curtailed especially for breakfast the allocation has to be lesser carbohydrate allocation has to be lesser than lunch and dinner so coming to medical therapy per se uh, we have good data with uh, a lot of data with insulin and uh, reasonable data with uh, metformin and small amount of data with glyburide metformin and glyburide both cross placenta and all oral agents lack long-term safety data. Insulin seems to be the preferred medication. So we'll be seeing briefly about the uh, different uh, areas uh, to be considered. Indication, insulin types, dosing, regimens, efficacy, safety. Uh, we don't have a robust evidence-based data for all these uh, areas. So where evidence-based data is not there, then we'll go with consensus. So the classical indication for insulin usage in pregnancy is where blood glucose targets are not met despite diet, physical activity, with or without metformin for one to two weeks. 
Many times insulin may be required at diagnosis itself if metformin is contraindicated or patient is at 7th or 8th week, severe vomiting. Fasting glucose of 126, frank diabetes at diagnosis. Not at frank diabetes but already complications we are noticing such as macrosomia or hydramnia where the compulsion to bring down the glycemia rapidly is very much there. As per the latest guidelines, as per the latest data, pre-existing PCOS or obesity are not a compelling or favored indication to continue metformin after conception. We can very well do with, go with insulin alone in such cases. This chart depicts the most commonly used uh, insulin types. Uh, on the top is the rapid acting analogs, Lispro, Aspart. There is uh, some data with faster Aspart and uh, Glulysin. They start acting very, very rapidly and peak effect is achieved around one to one and a half hours. After that is a regular insulin, it starts acting at 30 minutes, peak effect is achieved around two hours. NPH, Glargin and Detamir. There is considerable difference how we approach a non-pregnant adult diabetes control and how we approach a diabetes control in, pregnant, in pregnancy. Part of it has to do with how quickly we want to escalate titrate insulin rapidly and achieve a tight control. And second thing is the very stringent target itself. For example, we can see in GDM treatment goal will be like the fasting goals are fairly similar in the preparental glucose in both uh, GDM as well as in most of type 2 diabetics we try to keep it uh, in type 2 diabetics, most of them we try to keep it around 100. It's not very far from the GDM fasting goal where it is less than 95. However, if you see the postprandial control, it becomes far more stringent than a typical type 2 diabetes case. That's where the importance of uh, insulin and rapid acting analogs come. We can see the action curve here. Rapid acting analogs achieve a very fast uh, um, spike, then it, the action comes down, is the action curve. The regular human insulin has a slightly longer onset of action and lower peak and the action is spread over another one hour or so. So we can see because of the stringent criteria which has to be achieved within the first one or two hours, it becomes more imperative to consider using short acting analog over regular insulin. Brief word about uh, rapid acting insulin, insulins. Lispro and Aspart, uh, considerable data is there. They are comparable in immunogenicity to human regular insulin, better postprandial control. Some studies have shown lesser hypoglycemia as compared to regular insulin. Minimal transfer across placenta. There is no evidence of teratogenicity. Here we can see with uh, study with uh, insulin Aspart, they have plotted uh, 7 point or 8 point glucose values and compared it with human insulin. We, the plasma glucose is charted on the y-axis. This is the time point before breakfast or 90 minutes after breakfast, before lunch, 90 minutes after lunch, likewise. We can see clearly the dotted lines representing Aspart, uh, human insulin, in, in, in pregnant ladies using human insulin, the postprandial excursion is slightly higher than the ladies using Aspart. Thereby meaning that Aspart helps to, the same dose helps to achieve a better postprandial control. Similar data are available, some outcome based data are also available for uh, Lispro. Aspart has more of randomized control data and Lispro has more of observational data. Here we can see in comparison with regular insulin in a relatively large database, Incidents of large for gestational age, birth weight and severe maternal hypoglycemia were favorable for Lispro. Uh, but in this uh, study, in this meta-analysis, they also found that uh, Lispro group had a slightly lower BMI than the control group, which could have had some uh, influence on the weight. Initially, when Lispro was introduced with rapid control, some worsening of retinopathy was noticed. However, in larger trials, such concern has not been uh, seen. Coming to basal insulin, uh, Detamir is one of the safer insulins, intermediate acting. Duration of action is around 14 to 18 hours. In many cases, twice daily dosing will be required. It has a slightly lower IGF-1 receptor affinity and also probably slightly lower action through the insulin receptor itself. The more popular, uh, otherwise more popular basal insulin, Glargin, uh, ran into a lot of problems. Some in vitro studies showed it had a 6.5 fold higher affinity for IGF-1 receptor than the regular insulin. And it also was considered to have mitogenic action to a greater extent than insulin. However, uh, one particular study which examined the transplacental transfer, they showed that uh, 
at reasonable doses used in pregnancy there is no significant uh, crossing of placenta to influence fetal growth uh, otherwise uh, glargin uh, has been shown uh, not to have a very different effect from nph as far as birth is concerned it definitely had advantage as far as uh, lessening the incidence of maternal severe hypoglycemia as compared to nph uh, there are some other uh, trials which have shown this is a meta analysis which has shown that malformation rate was non significantly reduced with uh, glargin and there was a non significant tendency towards increase in respiratory distress syndrome with glargin so the current status is there is no high quality randomized controlled trial of glargin in pregnancy american association of endocrinology they feel that since patients with already existing pre, pre gestational diabetes if they enter into pregnancy while they are using glargin it is okay to let them continue glargin for a, a short while allow the patient to settle in the pregnancy state adjust the diet exercise pattern then go for change of insulin fda or ada do not recommend continuing glargin in pregnancy they want shifting immediately so insulin pumps have been tried in uh, many small trials uh, but uh, we have to teach the patient how to use it it takes the patient some time to adjust to insulin pump so it may not be the best option when a patient walks in with pregnancy and newly detected diabetes better to go with conventional therapy cost is high catheter is difficult to manage with the gravid abdomen so uh, many trials have not shown any consistent superiority over the conventional regimens where it is used there will be requirement for increased rate in early morning hours at least 2 to 3 basal infusion rates uh, may need to be set which insulin or insulin regimen to use which is a long standing question many trials have uh, tried to answer that uh, there is a sweet dap success program which was uh, done in america they used particular protocol in general suppose if you want to go for weight based dosing um, in a well established diabetes 0.7 to 1 unit per kilogram daily in divided doses may be a reasonable dose to start with there are also some trimester based dosing yield initial dosing advised like you go with a lower dosing in the first trimester slightly higher dosing in the second trimester and higher dosing in the third trimester of the two third of uh, the morning dose is uh, given as nph and one third as insulin as part and out of the one third allocated for the evening half as given as rapid acting and half as given as nph so these are all initial insulin dosing we have to rapidly titrate monitor and adjust Uh, the many trials have been done comparing different insulin regimens for the years uh, most many of them in the west done in type 1 diabetes and many of them in gdm status uh, cochrane uh, compiled a list of such randomized control trial with reasonable data on outcomes what they found was there was very low quality evidence small size sample trial the estimates had wide confidence interval so they didn't actually reach any conclusion they just told that there was too much heterogeneity to pronounce any finding out of it so it has to uh, be it has to come from a consensus and expert opinion uh, the the main difference with the classical non pregnant adult diabetes is in using uh, prandial insulin more and basal insulin less it will be preferable to start with prandial insulin target the meal at which postprandial excursions exceed target in cases where the fasting glucose exceeds 110 preferable to use basal or intermediate acting insulin at bed time for uncontrolled diabetes switching to basal bolus regimen from the beginning itself is ideal the very widespread popular option of premix 370 may not suit pregnancy glycemic targets for the above said reason that the postprandial 2 hour target and 1 hour target are very stringent which cannot be met with the very small ratio of rapid acting insulin in this combination only 30% is rapid acting 70% is longer acting so this may not help us in achieving strict glycemic uh, control in cases where they will definitely not accept uh, four times basal bolus insulin probably we can consider premix 5050 with a higher allocation of rapid acting insulin so a rough uh, chart for how to go about adjusting basal insulins most of the basal insulin uh, may need to be titrated every we, we can undertake titration every 3 days um, so for every 30 mg per deciliter or 40 mg per deciliter excursion we can consider adding two units based on the fasting glucose level 
for titration of bolus insulin very rapid titration every three days especially in the first uh, trimester is required to avoid any tetrogenicity and congenital anomalies uh, similarly for every 20 milligram per deciliter uh, extra glucose level encountered we can add approximately two units so these are all approximate uh, dosages for individual patient we may have to uh, use our judgment so three such scenarios I am depicting here, uh, which is frequently encountered in practice. One is a predominantly fasting uh, mild hyperglycemia. In many cases, if you see the as against the goal of 95, here it is 111. As against the two-hour goal of 120, it is 127. After lunch and after dinner are within the target levels. So it's predominantly mild fasting hyperglycemia. We have to make sure the patient herself is not very anxious. She is catching up on good sleep. If these things don't work, then within the first week, we can add a small dose of NPH at bedtime. The second uh, uh, type of presentation could be like this, where there is a predominant uh, after breakfast hyperglycemia, all other parameters are more or less uh, touching the normal zone. Here it is 147, almost uh, 25 to 30 points above the postprandial uh, target. There what we can do, the simple thing of splitting breakfast into two portions and rechecking after three days will resolve the issue in most cases. Where it doesn't happen, we can add a small dose of short acting or rapid acting analog, maybe two units of aspart or lispro can be added. Then there comes the more uh, <coughs> severe, more severe uh, hyperglycemia, where all the parameters appear elevated as compared to the target levels. There we have to go for basal bolus insulin. Uh, for example, here we have we are seeing a predominant uh, postprandial excursion, a slightly lesser after lunch and after dinner excursion, and fasting level itself is high. So this is just an example. This is not that this is the only way to go about it. Just an example. There we can consider using rapid acting insulin all three times just before the meal, and one bedtime NPH, four or five units. So any insulin regime we start with, you are going to recheck after three days to ensure that the glycemia is achieved rapidly and we are going to titrate as per the uh, glycemic records. So this is the status of uh, the available insulins. Insulin glulysin does not have adequate data. It is no more considered in management of GDM. And insulin deglutac has not accumulated any data so far, so we are not using it. And insulin glargin, since it ran into so many controversies, ADA is actually telling don't use it now. So again, we are not considering. So the the best basal insulin to use will be NPH itself. Since Detamir is not more efficacious, uh, we can as well use NPH itself. Intrapartum, we have to stop metformin transmission if already taken. We can start a drip, 5% extose or DNS, along with that continuous IV insulin infusion and one to two hourly monitoring. This will be the ideal setup. Suppose we cannot uh, do that, then second choice could be we can add insulin in 500 ml of 5% extras or DNS. Each bag of 500 ml we can infuse over 5 hours. And from the pre um, intrapartum subcutaneous insulin dosage, we can calculate how much is required. Probably about one fourth we can add in that insulin bag. Capillary glucose has to be done too early. But there could be cases of very mild uh, uh, diabetes with you know, almost non existent insulin dosage. Something like less than 20 units, probably we don't have to be aggressive during intrapartum. We can as well uh, leave them without any intrapartum insulin infusion. Postpartum, obviously, we are going to stop insulin after delivery. We are going to monitor capillary glucose for 24 to 48 hours. In patients who already had pre-gestational diabetes, we can start insulin at a lesser dose than their previous requirement and titrate. So, summary. Rapidly achieving glycemic control with the rigorous SMBG is very crucial. Basal bolus regimen is ideal. Aspart and Lispro preferred over regular insulin. NPH and Detamir are the currently approved basal insulins. Most women will need a higher dosage as pregnancy advance, advances. So there is no single favorable uh, dosage pattern. And small decrease in dose may happen closer to delivery. Thank you all for patient listening. Mm -hmm.